morning. Welcome to the fifth installment of our series, Have I Got News For You? It's been a great series. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I, I have, but then again, I say that every time. So I like everything that, uh, you know, uh, we, we talk about. So, uh, hey, this uh, morning we're going to continue this series. And, um, you know, what we've been talking about is what is the gospel? Essentially, how do we define the gospel? What is the, the way in which that we receive and understand the gospel? You know, it's important because words mean things, and oftentimes we find in the world in which we live the shifting meaning of words, uh, expectations, and the way in which we relate to one another through those things. Oftentimes in the modern church, you know, one of the things that happens is that we tend to reduce things down in an effort to try to articulate them quickly or to explain them to other people. And what ends up happening un, you know, unwittingly is that we begin to cut things out. We begin to just kind of minimize things. We begin to reduce things down. And the, in the process of reducing things, we're trying to hit the essence, but then we end up leaving out a lot of things that are powerfully part of what we mean when we say the, the word gospel. And so it's important for you and I then to come back and to stop every so often and then to step back and get a good and full understanding of what do we mean when we use that word. When we say the gospel, what is it that we're meaning? Do we have the same shared meaning? Because oftentimes uh, we can all say yes, that we believe in the gospel, and yet what we find out is in that process of talking to people is sometimes people have just literally a little piece of the gospel that they have made the whole gospel. Uh, there is a tendency in that to over-focus on one thing instead of looking at the whole picture. When we do that, that can lead us astray. The reality is, is that when we talk about the concept of heresy, heresy is not false teaching that comes from outside and then is introduced. Heresy is not things that happen in the world and then somehow overcome the church. That's false teaching. Heresy is the things that come up from within whenever we take a single concept, a truth that is in the Scripture, and then we overemphasize that to the exclusion of all else. In other words, we end up distorting things, we push things out of the picture of what they're supposed to be, and we create a whole new picture. This was Paul's warning to the church in Galatia when he told them that they had come to actually believe in another gospel. It wasn't that they were not still using the Scriptures, it wasn't that they weren't still articulating truths. Uh, but that they had distorted the entire picture by the overemphasis in one area. And so that's what heresy ultimately is, is the over-insistence on one particular thing that is true of the whole of Scripture, but we push it to the exclusion of other things or the distortion of other parts of the gospel. So it's important then for you and I, as we talk about what does it mean that we are a people of the gospel, that to preach the gospel, that we're using the same, that we're using that term in the same way, that we're talking about the same thing, that we're not talking about A, a distortion, or B, just simply a part of it that we like and leave the other things, or C, just really managing to cherry pick some things out of the gospel and then leading us someplace entirely different than we never meant to be. Now, one of the ways in which we have done that uh, over the last couple of weeks is we've been looking at this word euangelion. The very first week I talked about the word gospel uh, in the ancient Greco-Roman culture. It was not a sacred term. It was a secular term. It was a popular term. And it was primarily used in the idea of uh, bringing good news from the battlefront. In other words, the idea was is that when they were in a time of war, that the messenger, the angel, the euangelion, would bring good news from the battlefront and tell them about how the battle was going. And then the proclamation one was one of great joy. And so the literal phrase would often be that this is good news of great joy. How many people can think of something in the Bible that sounds a little bit like that? Like maybe when the angel was announcing to the shepherds in the field, right? He says, I've come, do not be afraid, I've come to bring you good news of great joy. And so this idea that the gospel is the good news of great joy that comes into our lives and reorients everything around itself. 
And so that term there, the angel or the messenger, uh, uh, being the idea that this is the one that brings forth those kinds of good things. In other words, an evangelist is someone who brings good news of great joy. So as we've been looking at this, we've been trying to look at the modifiers, things like the gospel of grace, the gospel of peace is what we're talking about today, uh, that we look at those modifiers and what they tell us about the way that, that Paul is using or Jesus or whoever else is using the word gospel. But also we want to include in that the greater context around those things so that we fully understand that when that word gospel is being used, that we neither reduce it nor add things to it that do not belong, that we are getting a clear and functional picture of what the gospel actually is. Now, with that in mind, as we talk about that whole thing of the battlefield, today we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, specifically talking about spiritual battle. And one of the things that brings this so much to light then is this whole idea of what does it mean for you and I for the good news to advance in the place of spiritual battle. So I think it's going to be really enlightening. I hope that you will enjoy it. We're going to take a look here, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. If you want to open up your Bible or your app, If you're using a phone or tablet, please do me the favor of setting that to silent uh, so that you don't disturb those around you. Otherwise, I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. Please follow along in whatever translation you have. The one in your lap is my absolute favorite because you're reading it. Let's take a look. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning verse 10, and we read these words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm, Stand therefore fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Blessed be the reading of God's holy word. So the opening words of that section are those words, finally be strong. Now, anytime a passage starts with the words finally, you know that you've got to consider the larger context in which it sets in. Uh, It's very important that I don't just read on from there without knowing what's behind that because otherwise I don't know what the finally is there for. And so there is an important uh, thing that you and I would take a step back at that point and look at that greater context. Now, I would have loved to spend this morning talking to you about that greater context. And I was wondering, you know, if you guys had like a couple of hours to hang out. Uh, yeah, some people are saying, sure. And everybody else is going, shh. What is he doing? What are you saying? The truth is, is that like, you know, nobody wants to sit here for many hours. Well, maybe not nobody, but, but most of us don't want to sit here for many hours. But there is still the importance that you and I would go back, that we would roll back, look across that text, and we would pick up the finer points of what's happening so that he says to us, finally be strong. In that context, he is talking about the, royal, the role of oikos relationships. Now, the reason I use that word oikos, the Greek word there, is because oftentimes we just read in the English the word household and we kind of go over it like a speed bump really quickly. But that word oikos has a a profound meaning. It is a much larger word than just simply household. It is the word from which we get our word for economy. 
It's talking about those fundamental relationships that make life work. So in the household, it can include, of course, the husband and wife relationship. It can include the relationship of parents and children. Uh, in that case, in particular, in Rome, where one in four people on the street was a slave, not thinking of slavery like American slavery, but in the sense of a, in, uh, in uh, servitude or in bondage, in debt, you know, like you and your credit card company have a relationship. Um, and uh, there is this idea of what that means to be that there is, these are fundamental relationships. Particularly, you may have heard me say, if you've been here uh, before, uh, talking about the whole idea as we understand what it means to be an elder in the biblical text. And it talks about the importance of a believing oikos. You've got to consider the fact that in that day and time, we're talking about a time of patronage, especially in Rome, in which three out of four people, uh, in the, in, when you're in Rome proper, would have been dependent on a patron. The idea of a patron being someone who is wealthy and has means, and which then everybody in the circle, in the oikos of the patron, depended upon them for their daily living. They could have been a slave in debt to them. It could have been the child. It could have been the spouse. It also could be any number of people who functionally got their assistance in life, that they made their way, not by doing a specific job, but by being at the beck and call of their patron. And so they would make their living. And so the expression, you know, when people say something like, hey, don't patronize me, is referring to this relationship back in ancient Rome in which where someone was dependent upon somebody and then if they wanted a raise or they wanted a little extra money for something, they would tell them, well, you're so pretty. You know, no, they didn't say, they said, you're so handsome, you're smart, you're the best at everything and, and they would patronize them in hopes that they would get a little more patronage in their pocket that day. That was a way of relating to people in a way that was not always the healthiest situation. And so in the, in the Bible, when it talks about the importance of an elder having a believing household, it's not simply talking about the fact that their children uh, would be believers or that their spouse was a believer. But I want you to think in terms of in, in that time when churches didn't meet in church buildings like this, didn't have public assemblies in that way, but they met house to house, from home to home. And so the likelihood of someone having a home large enough to have other people in it, it's not like the United States where everybody has a house with many rooms. First century Roman culture, especially out in the outlying areas, people often lived in a single room. That's where they did their eating, their sleeping, their cooking, their everything happened in that little space, right? A lot of it was even done outside simply because there was not room. It was a roof over your head to keep you dry in times of storm. It was not something that you created in which you brought people in and entertained. That is something fairly recent in terms of our culture even. But specifically in Roman times, that would have been limited to people who were patrons, people who had the means to have large homes and to be able to have people in. And so it was fundamentally important when the church is essentially illegal and it's gathering, that everybody who was in the circle of the patron would be somebody who was a believer and not be a sellout. The problem could be if a patron was not financially as strong as somebody else and somebody wanted to gain more, they weren't getting from their patronage what they wanted out of the patron, that they would turn that church over to the authorities in order to please somebody else and get more money from them or get into another circle of patronage to line their own pockets. And so the idea of having a believing household was absolutely critical, not just in the sense of wanting one's children to believe, not just wanting one's wife to believe, but literally for the safety of the church. If the oikos, the greater fellowship around that person was not stable, safe, and otherwise it could be exploited financially and make the church suffer. And so it was very important that every household, every oikos was functional and you could see how that would absolutely change the nature of relationships. What if the patron doesn't have good relationships 
in his household or her household in the case of Lydia that would make it safe for the entire church. So the passage here is speaking to how central good relationships in the oikos are to the unity of the church. The context leading up to that talks about that household and how it functions together. And it's saying that that is really critically important. But here in particular, he singles in on those relationships in which there are people, members of that household who have authority over other believers. In case there is a relationship in which there is authority over someone else who is also a believer. So believer to believer becomes part of the issue that he is talking about in terms of standing in spiritual warfare before the Lord. So, and what he tells them is in this relationship, whether you are the person who is in authority or the person who is under authority, that it is critical in that relationship that you do everything you do in that relationship as unto the Lord. Not making one, the job of leadership, harder than it needs to be, but always doing everything to the glory of God. Now, secondly, the thing that's in there and inherent to the whole thing is the additional burden upon those who are in authority. It is their additional burden that they are to represent God to those who are under their authority. And when they do that poorly or they are heavy-handed or they conduct themselves in such a way as to misrepresent God, they not only do harm to the fellowship of believers, they do not only do harm to that relationship, but they misrepresent God, disrespecting God and His creation and invite judgment on self. It's one of the things in which you'll think about that Paul said uh, to the church when he was talking about the whole issue of fathers in the household and the critical importance of their care, their love, their protection of their family. And he says essentially that if you don't do those things, you're worse than an unbeliever. In other words, there is the responsibility over that person who is in authority not to lord over or to have control or to make people obey as much as it is to represent God in such a way that God is glorified and those who are under you can trust you with that authority. Likewise, it is important for those who are under authority not to be rebellious, right? The whole idea of uh, rebellion in the Scripture is that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It's destructive. It undermines everything. It causes divisive problems. But in particular, what he's saying here in this context is that those relationships of both authority and those under authority, that what happens in that relationship is critical to the fellowship of the church. Now, I got to tell you that over the years, uh, when I think about this whole issue of relational things and about the church, is I've got to say that in 30 plus years of doing ministry, listen, I have never seen the church split that actually happened over a doctrinal point. Sometimes it was packaged as a doctrinal point, but the truth was is that it was the underlying relational issues that were going on between people that actually got disguised in a moment. And so even whenever it was something as pitiful as like the color of the carpet or something as serious as how people approach uh, the altar for communion and things like that, that what was really going on underneath the surface was that there were interpersonal relationships that were messed up, jacked up, and then people were not relating to one another in a godly way that would bring unity to the body of Christ. Oftentimes, one of the most difficult things uh, comes back to those home relationships, to those oikos relationships. And so Paul says, be strong in the Lord, us thus equating, if you will, relational battles with spiritual warfare. Now, you and I tend to see relational battles or trials or difficulties usually simply as person-to-person conflict. But Paul says the struggle is never just about interpersonal conflict because hidden in the equation 
is this whole thing of the schemes of the devil. He says we are not ignorant of his schemes. In other words, we need to be aware that he works in situations, uh, oftentimes just like this, and it's always his effort to try to divide us, to amplify the small things, quote unquote, into big things, to divide persons, to put leader and follower at odds, to provoke leaders to lord over, to provoke those under his authority to rebel against. And in this instance, the spiritual warfare is essentially the relational problems, specifically in the home that work out spilling over into the fellowship of believers and creating division. Let me give you an example of that just for real practical kind of sense. Uh, this morning as you were making your way in, you know, having your weekly fight in the car, I mean your weekly discussion about what is, has to happen during the rest of the day and things like that, and then people begin to talk about things and they're having discussion and before long, all of a sudden it begins to escalate and you get to church and you do this. You slam the door and it's fine. And then you turn around and you have your church face on. I know none of you have actually done that. I'm just confessing my sin. Because I know nobody here does that. And then we go into church with the church face on and pretend like everything's all right. And now we are going to engage Almighty God and worship the, 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 the intimacy of intimacy, the, the sense of tenderness that is supposed to be there in the fellowship. And how ready are you to talk and sing about the goodness of God when you just had a fight with your spouse or your children or whoever? And so we come there and we stand there and what do we do? Or worse yet? How much worship is happening in that? Can I tell you, not only are you not engaging the Lord, not only are you pretending something else that, than is what is really going on. I mean, you know, I'm not saying bring your fight into the church lobby. But maybe it might be a better thing to sit out there and reconcile before you come in so you don't have to put on the plastic face, right? I, 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 that it's okay to say, you know, there's nothing really greatly accomplished by my standing there pretending to worship as much as if I could actually engage God in worship and engage the others around me. But not only that, but then that begins to rub off on the other relationships around us. And so then now we're short with other people because we were already being short with those who are under our authority or over in authority over us. And when we have this kind of tension that begins to build, and so then we do what? We actually end up kind of sitting all to ourselves, no engagement, no relationship, nothing happening, and we fail to actually act like the body of Christ. Can I tell you that, in, like I said, in, in all the arguments about the color of the carpet and things like that, it was usually between family members who were no longer speaking to one another in the same church. Hello? That kind of stuff is really dysfunctional. And so in the first 10 years of ministry, uh, I spent a lot of time, I was a part of a fellowship that really believed, was ardently cessationist, that thought that, you know, that uh, the, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit essentially uh, was over when the apostles passed. And uh, so therefore also that Satan, you know, was not busy doing anything because uh, everything had just stopped with the apostles. Um, I, I clearly don't believe that today, but can I just tell you that it really set up the groundwork then for the enemy to work completely unabated because there was no sense in which there was an awareness that spiritual warfare was at work in moments like that. It was simply interpersonal conflict. Paul says that all of these things are spiritual. Did, have you ever have you figured that part out yet that life, everything about life is inherently spiritual? That, that those divisions between what is spiritual, what is supernatural, and what is natural are actually just in our minds. That the world, that the way it really works is that God is in all, through all, and over all, and all things are held together by Him who is its head. That the biblical worldview is not that there is a great separation between those things in the sense of that, uh, that we can departmentalize, but that all things are inherently spiritual, that you and I as spiritual beings interact with the world around us as spirit beings, spirit to spirit. Spirit. 
And so the need for that full armor of God in it is to recognize the battle even in our relationships and to never let our guard down and to not relegate those interpersonal conflicts to just simply a personal small problem, but to attack them with a sense of spiritual ferocity because small problems are the things that usually take people out, divide fellowships, and cause difficulty one to another. They are the things that actually wreck fellowship. Now, let me give you an example in this. You know, the other day as I was uh, preparing for this message and thinking about this whole idea of the gospel of peace, I was doing some research and I was reading after an author that I think the world of and, and I, I really like him, but he's, a, he's very much an academic and I just didn't know, you know. I mean, there's the, your, the one sense you read their books and you love the things that they say, but you wonder to yourself, I don't, you know, I don't have an interpersonal, I've never had dinner with this person, I've never been in their home, I don't know what they're really like, I have my perceptions, uh, in particular this author I've even exchanged emails with, and so I feel like I kind of know them, but I, yet I just don't know the intimacies of their life and how they act and, and everything else. And so I was reading, and on this subject matter, uh, here in Ephesians chapter 6, and he says, you know, isn't it interesting that when I am getting ready, I'm preparing to teach on, or I am writing on this subject of spiritual warfare, that things happen. It always seems to be that just things unravel. Things happen in interpersonal relationships. Things happen in our home. He goes, uh, I, was doing, I was preparing one time for a message, and suddenly the construction worker outside put his nail gun through the power line, and, and the whole house was knocked out of power. And so I had to wait. I could, and I ended up not being able to finish that work and had to go on to do other things, leave the house to go do this other work. And I, it took me a long time to get back to that message and to prepare it simply because one nail gun got shot through the power line. He goes, another time, he says, actually, when I was preparing this manuscript, as I was trying to get this ready, he says, my word processor certainly, su suddenly crashed and I was unable to continue this and I had to wait till later in order that I could address this and finish this part. And he goes, it's not because what Tom says is so important, it's because the subject matter is so important because the enemy has had free reign to run about in our lives, to run amok, and we don't, he, does, he wants us to be ignorant of his schemes and how he works in the subtleness of things and how he works in relationships and how he works in circumstances, how he especially he loves to work when there is someone in authority over someone else, either to provoke one to rebel or to the other to lord over or both, right? That can certainly work division in a household and that it spills over into the church and that eventually we have very little witness because we're behaving exactly the way the world does under the same kind of pressure, circumstances, divisiveness, arguments. And so we become just like the world and our kids grow up under that circumstance and they flee the church because they see no difference. And parents, the fault is not the church because the first proclamation of the gospel is the way we live at home. And if there's a huge contradiction between those two things, there's no message I can preach that can overcome that. There's no youth group activity that can overcome that. That's called discipleship, and it begins at home. So in this context, he says that the way that you and I prepare then for this spiritual battle is not to ignore the subtle realities or to run the other way, but that we address these things first and foremost by our own behavior. N not only that we pray against the devil, but we continue to engage by actually living 
in the opposite spirit. See, if you and I declare things and proclaim things or even pray things, but there is no life that goes along with it, it's powerless. Let me say this, and I, I've got to say this very carefully. I, I, hopefully I articulated it well in the first service because that's the one that went online, and hopefully now I will articulate it well to you. Please do not misunderstand what I'm saying. But typically when we come to a text like Ephesians 6, what we do is we do kind of what like we do with our children. With children, we teach them to pray, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord, so you know it too. And you learn that model of teaching our children from somebody else who taught his disciples. Our Father, so it's, it's an okay method, right? There's nothing wrong with teaching people rote prayers in order to explain something and to articulate something, to give them something. It's just that we don't stay there. But I can remember as a child at times when I was first learning and I would say, Mom, Dad, what's the prayer for when I'm scared in my bed? What's the prayer for when someone's being a bully? What's the prayer for? And I was waiting for the magical words, right? The incantation almost as it were because I was immature and did not understand. And then my parents had to explain to me that what living faith looks like and how to have a relationship with God and that these were models but they were not the only thing I could pray. That took a long journey and learning to pray and have that relationship myself with the Lord versus just what my parents handed me, not complaining about what my parents handed me, just recognizing that we can treat prayers like incantations. And sometimes when it comes to Ephesians 6, we can mistakenly do the same thing. There is nothing wrong with praying God, give me the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, gird up my loins with truth, and all those things in a spiritual warfare situation. Nothing wrong with that. However, if you and I just declare those things, but then we do nothing differently, we behave in no way differently, we are not allowing the Spirit of God to work in us, to transform us. If we continue to lord over or to rebel, nothing changes, and the spiritual warfare continues unabated no matter how many times you shout out those prayers and incantations because that is not the power of God unto salvation. It is not the gospel of peace. It's not the working of the power of the Spirit in that situation. It's just you repeating a bunch of empty words that you apparently don't believe honestly because you're not allowing those words in the context to actually transform your life. So the real context in this situation when we're reading through that, if you look at what he's saying, he's saying, look, He's, I want you to prepare yourself, and he goes through that armor, not so that you and I can just repeat those words. Again, nothing wrong with repeating the words. But he's making points. And the primary point is this, that you and I would live a righteous life. Not just simply say that I have a breastplate of righteousness, but that you and I would conduct ourselves in righteousness, that we would believe the truth of what God's word says, we would believe the truth of what Christ is, we would believe the truth of the gospel, and the outworking of that would be that there would be righteousness, that those things would exude from us, that we would, ha our, that we would be covered in salvation, that we would be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and then we would be ourselves ready with that gospel of peace. That means that we would take peace, that we would proclaim peace, that we would bring peace into the situations acting in a counter spirit to the spirit of the world. See, the spirit of the world, when it's in the midst of conflict, escalates the conflict. If you say something mean to me, I say something mean to you. If you poke me, I poke you. You hit me, I hit you back. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Right? That's actually a limit in the Old Testament. Limiting the response. Because the real way of the world is, Poke out my eye, I'll take both of yours. Right? You're gonna, I'm going to punish them. They will never do that again. That's the spirit of the world. 
The spirit of the world is everywhere we find division, where we find hatred, where we find racism, where we find you know, contradictions against all of these things that God is trying to make one new person, one new humanity. He begins with reconciling Gentiles to Israel. That's the mystery of the gospel. But the gospel of peace continues and that it brings into those relationships, even ones where there is authority and the ability to have corruption in that authority, And he says, no, bring all of those things back under the spirit of Christ. That's, we are aware of his schemes, that he is plotting and working in all of these relationships. So not that I end up seeing a spook under every bush, running around declaring, I I plead the blood of Jesus over that, I plead the, that's great, but if you're not living it, that the most important thing I do in spiritual warfare is that I equip myself with truth, I believe that truth, I let it begin to work through my life in righteousness, it begins to change my life and the function of who I am and how I interact with other people and that I become a peacemaker. Remember Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. He didn't say the people who stand there and wait for something to happen. There's a sense of engagement in which you and I bring this gospel, this good news of reconciliation, of the power to overcome these things so that we do not participate in the spirit of the world. That's how the kingdom comes now. Not just the sweet by and by kingdom. Like, oh God, I can't wait to get out of here. I know you probably felt like that a lot in the last year, right? Oh, come on, be honest. Thank you. One person being, okay, so. There are times when we find ourselves in that kind of frustration. We we just say, I just want out of here. But listen, the kingdom now is not us going away. The kingdom now is when the spirit of God is at work in us and we work against the spirit of the world. That is the greatest spiritual warfare there is. That you and I come into conflict with those things not because we're as belligerent as they are, or crafty in our mic drop little speeches and things like that, but because we do not behave like that. That we are fundamentally different because the Spirit of God is at work within us. The awareness that the enemy can exploit relationships or that the Holy Spirit can use those relationships to bring glory to himself and that through those relationships, the people in our oikos get saved, our sphere of influence. Whether it's a spouse, in the case of where two people are married and one is a Christian and one is not, or as you're raising your children, anyone here ever pray that prayer? Oh God, save my child. Oh God, work in their heart in a way. I I don't know what else to do. I'm at at rope's end. Few are saying, which child do you meet no (laughs) what about the other significant relationships where you are either under authority or an authority over and isn't your heart's desire for them to know the Lord that your influence in their in those relationships would be ones that would draw people to Christ not drive them away In that description of the battle gear, the first offensive weapon then becomes the sword of the spirit. One of the things I find interesting about that is that um, when you look at the language in the New Testament about the sword of the spirit, even in Hebrews chapter 4, the sword of the spirit is sharper than a two-edged sword. It's talking about the piercing nature of the word of God to the believer, not to the unbeliever. And so the weapon, in that sense of of going on the the, the offensive, is you and I look at the way that that, the, the word of God is used repeatedly throughout all the examples in the book of Acts and, and how the church conducted itself It wasn't about beating up people around them or outsmarting them or outwitting them or saying cunning things. It was much more like the Old Testament imagery of the sword of the Spirit being the the, the sword of his mouth from Isaiah chapter 11, 
Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah 52, where Messiah strikes the earth with the sword of his mouth. In other words, it's prophetic images. It's speaking the words of Messiah with the authority he speaks being spoken by those who actually know what the gospel is. But over and over again, as you look for that kind of imagery of going on the offensive in the New Testament, it's not really there. It isn't. Now, just like you, I, there are times where someone has come across me or done something to me, and man, I'm just like you. Man, I, I, where's that song? You know, the one where it's to call down fire from heaven, right? Uh, you know, and, and I'm, I, I, you know, I want to pray those prayers, those imprecatory psalms, you know, and, and say, you know, God rescue me by, you know, demolishing my enemies. But the interesting thing is, is that wherever we find the Apostle Paul speaking of spiritual warfare, he says that it's important to pray in the Spirit on all occasions making requests and all kinds of prayers and to, and to stay alert. That the prayer that he's talking about is not the prayer against the enemy, but instead, pray for me that I might be effective, that I might do what is right when everyone else isn't. You see, the overall picture of warfare in the New Testament is not combative, but subversive. It's the undermining power of the gospel that, that throw, overthrows the power of darkness by operating in a completely different spirit. If they curse, we bless. If they kill and maim, we heal and bind up. If they steal, kill, and destroy, we give. We comfort those who mourn. We bring reconciliation. Because ours is a gospel of peace. Do you understand? Then the shodding our feet with the gospel of peace is that whole thing where you and I go to bring peace into the situation. We, we, we go into the conflict. We go wherever the spiritual warfare is and we interject that message of peace because we function in a completely different spirit. We do not give into the spirit of the age. We do not give into the spirit of the world. We do not justify to ourselves how, well, we're just doing the same thing they did or, well, what if I don't and what if they get away with this and whatever else... Somewhere in there, we have to believe that God is the one who settles all accounts, don't we? If you have to have your pound of flesh, haven't you said fundamentally that God will not take care of all things? That you don't believe that he is good, able to reconcile? Can I ask you a question? If he can't do that, then how can he even guarantee you a place eternally because it's predicated on the idea that he will set all things right on heaven and earth and bring them into alignment that's why the early church believed so strongly in the idea of letting things go turning the other cheek, to maintain the relationship, to close the gap, to function in a completely different spirit. I'm not talking about pacifism, where you just ignore everything. I'm talking about intentionally walking into the fight, armed with the gospel of peace. I'm talking about intentionally walking into the fight by being kind, by being merciful, by being loving, by being self-controlled. Because the weapons of our warfare are spiritual, not the weapons of the world. Remember, the weapons of the enemy are what? Fleshly. And we do not battle against flesh and blood, but in the power of the Spirit. It's the confidence that we have that God is able to move and work in that context. Now you might say, 
well, you know, I know you're talking about the gospel of peace today, but, you know, if you look, I mean, you know, Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, I don't think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. He does say that. Again, let me zoom out and look at the bigger context. You see, the battle is between two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And when you align yourself with the kingdom of light, you have made an enemy. And the problem becomes is that sometimes that that even works in our own oikos, in our own, uh, our own fundamental relationships and stuff, and that he's warning them, listen, this is what happens when you receive the gospel of peace, when you receive the good news of your salvation, when you cling to me, when you turn against the ways of the world to turn toward the ways of the kingdom, when you walk in light instead of in darkness, this is what will happen. Sometimes, even your very own family will turn against you, and I'm telling you to cling to me and cling to this, but then how do you do that? You do spiritual warfare by acting in the opposite spirit, not by slaughtering them, not by beating them down, not by outwitting them, not by telling them they're stupid because they don't think like you, not by sophistry, not by division, not by tribalism, not by argument, not by bitterness. We proclaim with our lives that ours is another kingdom. The darkness hates those who belong to Christ. That kingdom steals, kills, and destroys. That kingdom hates that this kingdom loves, heals, and hopes. The kingdom of darkness proclaims division, tribalism, racism, and then calls it tolerance, only to divide people more. But the gospel of peace proclaims unity, reconciliation through Jesus Christ, making one new humanity, one human family. Can I just point out to you that before the Bible text said that, there is nothing in any written literature on all the earth prior to Christianity that speaks of the idea of one human family Nothing before Christianity does that. That is a distinctly Christian doctrine. Take it back. Take it back. It belongs to us. It is the message of our Christ and his kingdom. And so the gospel, the good news of peace, takes something like the mystery of the gospel that has God reconciling Jew and Gentile, and that it takes that and moves it out to where God is reconciling not just God and man, which is often the focus of how we preach the gospel, or Jew and Gentile, which is oftentimes the focus of other sectarian groups, but also male and female, slave and free, bringing every authority under heaven into alignment with the kingdom of God, subduing every power and authority in the earth until his kingdom comes into its fullness. And so between now and then, we stand with the gospel of peace. And we proclaim it by living it. We push back against the forces of darkness and all the schemes of the enemy by doing everything to the glory of God refusing to tackle those problems in our own strength, in our own might, refusing to continue propagating the sufferings and the means of the world, but to trust in God alone, not in our might, not in our power, but in the Lord's. And you know what happens when that, when that takes place? Real spiritual warfare takes place when you and I live in that opposite spirit. Real battles begin to be waged. And I can promise you it will be difficult. It is hard. At times, they will do everything they can to convince you to do the battle in the flesh. They will say things because the spirit that's at work in the world will come in con in, into conflict with you and will push their buttons and will make you want to react right in that same spirit. And when it happens... Say to yourself, this is spiritual warfare. 
It doesn't have to be the boogeyman. It doesn't have to be Satan himself. It doesn't have to be wars and rumors of wars. It can be right now where my child, my spouse, my friend, my coworker, my boss, or whoever is now acting in a way that is completely ugly and, and unreceptive. And in that moment, my call to battle is to walk in the opposite spirit to not give in to the temptation to be like the world and to be confident that the Holy Spirit who is at work within me is able to do that battle. It doesn't mean you're going to walk away with the way you like everything. It doesn't mean it's always going to go the way. Today's battle might be tomorrow's victory. You don't know. But between now and then, the kingdom now not just the sweet by and by kingdom that we're going to get to eventually, but that prayer that Jesus prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth is saying, God, let your rule, your reign work in me that I will walk in that opposite spirit, that I'll do that spiritual warfare and I'll deal with the things of the enemy right here and now by walking in the opposite spirit, confident in the power of his presence and his spirit at work within me. That church is real spiritual warfare and that is what the gospel of peace is all about so let's wrap things up here the gospel is the good news of jesus death burial and resurrection the gospel is the promise of forgiveness of sins and life eternal the gospel is the present good news of healing of freedom of empowerment and transformation the gospel is an open door for those who do not know God to be reconciled to Him and to be included, added into spiritual Israel. The gospel is the power that reconciles people across every dividing line that men can muster, reconciling all of humanity one, uh, to one another and through Christ. And finally, it is the realization of the kingdom of God right now when you and I live according to the Spirit rather than according to the flesh by waging a war of mercy, of love, of joy, of peace, of patience, of goodness, of kindness, of gentleness, of faithfulness, and self-control. That's what it looks like when you and I live contrary to the spirit of the world. It's not only inviting, but it is life-changing. It is world-changing. And best of all, it's available now. It's a now word for the church. Not the sweet by and by where you and I escape, but the present power and authority of the kingdom of God at work in the world in which you and I live. And I like that. I hope you do too. Let's stand together, shall we? We hope you enjoyed worshiping with us. If you would like more info about any of the ministry opportunities or to stay connected, please visit myvineyard.church. If you're watching us on YouTube, stay up to date with us by subscribing and hitting the notification bell. You can also connect to us through Facebook or Instagram. God bless and stay safe. We'll see you next week.